In this lecture, we're looking at French Calvinism or the French Reformed Movement and the highs and the lows and the persecutions and the wars that occurred there throughout the 16th century and on into the 17th century. And one of the things we have to, again, note is that the Reformed Movement was, you might say, promiscuous. It always reached out. It always attempted to ingratiate itself with members of Protestant churches from other countries. You see this in people like Calvin and Bullinger and Beza and others who are always really writing to those throughout Europe who might be partners with them for their faith. At times, it is a bit of an apologetics. They're trying to make sure that people move more in the reform direction, say on the sacraments, than towards the Lutheran direction. But it's mostly about making friends and colleagues and allies because, in part, the Swiss are more isolated than the Lutheran movement. And just their natural bent is to reach out to others. Well, one of the first groups that really begins to take on a new sort of verve and interest with the Reformed movement are these French Reformed people, or French Calvinists, as they're sometimes called. Now, these folks go by another name. And in fact, the name we're going to use throughout this lecture is probably preferred because when you say French Calvinism, it makes it sound as if the French folks are entirely derived or dependent upon Calvin's thinking. And that's just simply not true. The name that is often used for these folks is the Huguenots. Or if you want to anglicize it, you can call them the Huguenots. There really is no distinction. However you want to pronounce it, go right ahead. I'm going to call them the Huguenots because I have a teacher's voice in my head who taught me this word when he was lecturing on it long ago, and so I always say Huguenot. But plenty of people in particularly the English-speaking world say Huguenot. Well, who are these folks? Well, these are, by and large, a group of folks who, depending on the decade, are a ragtag group of minority figures who are Reformed and Protestant, but who, for whatever reason, are unable to flee to areas that are overwhelmingly Protestant, and so they end up staying in a Catholic country in France. At other points throughout the 16th century, they actually become a pretty significant percentage of the population, particularly in urban centers, places like Paris. Estimates range from two to two and a half million at its heyday in the 1560s, which would make the Huguenots roughly one-eighth to one-tenth of the population. Now, that might sound like small numbers, small beans, but in actuality, when you look at this from just a cultural or a sociological standpoint, to have one in ten be devoutly or at least by name part of the Protestant Reformed movement is frankly significant. A modern comparison is that some estimates about the modern Chinese church, in particular the underground church, is that they have reached a point where they are roughly one out of ten. Now, modern numbers are, of course, harder to dictate, but historical ones are also hard. But you should know that one out of ten is, from the Protestant perspective, a significant number. We're talking about millions of Protestants throughout France. This also explains why the Catholic faith was so concerned about the Huguenots. It's not that they are few and far between and that they just simply ethnically cleanse the Huguenots from their midst. There is, and in particular by the 1560s, a real significant concern amongst the Catholic majority that the Huguenots were going to take over. And this is particularly the case whenever the Huguenots began to infiltrate the noble ranks and the noble houses. Now, one myth to go ahead and get rid of if you've ever heard this, a lot of the propaganda about the Huguenots, a lot of the foundation, you might say, for the persecution of them, rested in large part on this claim by Catholics that the Huguenots were entirely militant, something like guerrilla warriors in their midst, always lurking about trying to overthrow the government. As we'll say here throughout this lecture, of course, there is a sense in which the Huguenots are militarized. They actually go to war at times. They participate in battles. They have blood on their hands at times, as much as the Catholics have blood on their hands. But we need to be careful not to see the Huguenots as a sort of bristling armed to the teeth group who are ready to overthrow and murder everybody in sight. A lot of that impression, again, is driven by the propaganda against them, which is never a sure ground whenever you're attempting to understand a populace. Well, what's the backstory? What is the origin of a lot of this fight? 
Well, in the life of Calvin, we see a bit of a microcosm as to what is going on in France. There were all throughout France from even before the Reformation, a real robust humanist movement that at times sparked and inspired folks to become Protestant. Now, this is more at the elite level, meaning at the academic level or at the level of the leaders of society. We have to have a fair amount of education, frankly, to be a humanist. This is not the average lay person we're talking about here. But the microcosm for what Calvin went through is he and a number of others during his education had a great deal of freedom to explore and to delve into all kinds of humanist works. And they were even free, at least in terms of no one looking over their shoulder, to read Luther whenever they came across his works. You can contrast that with Henry VIII's England and its banning of books and its imposition of Catholicism and its not allowing any of these texts or ideas to come into their country if they could stop it. The French king at the time, in the early days, Francis I, saw himself as a humanist king. He saw himself as a thoughtful, reasonable, you might say moderate, though that word is used and abused today to mean someone who doesn't care about anything. But Francis is not this draconian, really sort of tyrannical Catholic for a number of years up until the 1530s. Not only that, but his sister, Marguerite of Navarre, is one of the most important evangelicals in the entirety of France. His own sister, in other words, has, though covertly, and she never leaves the Catholic Church officially, she's right there on the edge, though, but she actually supports and lobbies for Protestants to not be persecuted under her brother's regime. Well, a lot of this, again, is driving and inspiring folks to come right up to the line of Protestantism, by and large. Again, not in mass numbers, but there are certainly a wide group of folks that are doing this. And this really speaks to something about the Reformation that we can acknowledge, which is whenever the clergy and whenever those in power, whenever the educated groups begin to really get affected by something, whenever they, say, become more Protestant or lean that way, you immediately see, or you tend to see at least, a trickling down of this into the laity. This is not an age in general, of widespread cynicism amongst the laity about whether or not they're supposed to follow their clergy's ideas or their preaching. Often folks would listen to their pastors and would go along with them. At the very least, you have Protestants or people leaning that way beginning to instill or plant seeds, you might say, in favor of at least a trajectory towards Protestantism. Well, all this comes to a head in 1534 in something called the Affair of the Placards. This is a famous moment. This is actually one of the main instigating moments that drives Calvin from France for the remainder of his life down to Switzerland. There were a number of folks who got a bit punchy about their Protestantism in Paris. And on one night in 1534, they printed off and they posted a number of placards all throughout the city that mocked the mass and, in part, spoke ill of some of the veneration of the Virgin Mary. Well, that's bad enough, doing these kinds of covert things against the king's wishes or against the mayor of the city. The worst part of it, though, is someone at some point snuck in and put one on the king's bedchamber door. Now, that's treasonous, frankly, and it might not feel like so. You know, we're thinking it's just a poster, you know, it's just a piece of paper. Why would this be treason? Well, just imagine someone sneaking into the White House in the middle of the night and posting some anti-American propaganda onto the door of the White House bedroom chamber as the president and his wife are in there sleeping. Essentially, what it is saying is, we differ with you, you Catholics, and hey, by the way, we can get to you while you're sleeping. This kind of scary, treasonous sense of a strongly worded phrase that has some ominous undertones to it. As a result, Francis turns on those who are evangelical. There was a burning of a number of known evangelicals there in Paris, just outside of Notre Dame. And it goes back and forth for a while. A number flee, heading down to places like Switzerland and other places. A number of them conform and hide their faith and go into hiding. Well, again, over time, the Huguenots, as they come to be known as, develop and evolve until the point where they are really beginning to rise up the ranks and become really an established group. Not established in the sense of being an institution, but established in the sense of being 
so large and so unwieldy that the Catholic Church and the nobility have to take note. Now, to understand what's about to happen from roughly 1560 on, you have to realize that there are three houses and three names that we're going to have to get familiar with here. What we have here is we have a ruling family, the Valois family. And the Valois family, again, is the lineage from whom the monarchy comes from. So Francis I is part of the Valois family. Now, the ruling family always, always, always in a kingdom will have convictions, but rarely will be the bludgeoning tool that tries to root out all kinds of heresies and problems and kill the populace. Ruling families and kings often care more about taxes, stability, and order than they do about righteous vengeance on all of their subjects. So you have to see the Valois in part as leaning Catholic, very strongly Catholic, actually. But they are going to really be unwilling, at least for a period of time, to allow or to open the floodgates for other Catholic noble houses or groups to really go after the Huguenots. So at times when you see the Valois kind of pumping the brakes, you have to say, okay, they're still Catholic. They're still on the side of those who are Catholic. But they're trying to maintain order and peace without bloodshed, at least in general. Though, as we'll see by the end, they let that go. The two other families are the Guy and the Bourbons. The Guy household is, again, a noble house, not the ruling family at this point. They have a claim to the throne. If you were to go back in time and ask any of the Guy, should they be on the throne, they would be unanimous in saying yes, but they don't have the throne at this point. They are part of the nobility, though. The Guy are hardline Catholic, you might say. Not neo-Catholic or excessively Catholic in terms of their doctrine, but they're hardline in the sense that they want to truck no nonsense with these evangelicals who are in their midst. They want them either executed, purged, or removed. The other group is the Bourbons. The Bourbon family, the Bourbon line, and there are others as well, I'm just giving you one major one here, are those who become really influenced and taken over, you might say, by this reformed Protestantism. So as we go through this, I'm going to stop at every point whenever I can. If you see someone who's Valois or ruling family, if it's the queen mother, if it's the king or somebody, you're talking about a Valois. If you see someone who is Catholic attacking Huguenots, who's not part of the ruling house, they're going to be Guy, and often the name Guy will be in their name. And if you see the Bourbons, you can assume these are Protestants. Now, one little caveat. The story here of the Huguenots is not simply a matter of dynastic squabbles or fights. The Huguenots are powerful because they have reached the laity. There are widespread numbers of just lay folk and your common everyday workhorse workmen pastors who are simply attempting to shepherd the flock and feed them. However, the fate of the Huguenots is going to rest on this political tussling back and forth. A lot of the reason why the Huguenots eventually have to flee into exile is because, in a lot of ways, the Guy managed to convince the Valois to let them go after these Huguenots. In 1560, there was something called the Amboise Conspiracy. And the Amboise Conspiracy was, in part, something of a theological move as well as a political move. And this is done by the Bourbons. And the idea here is they want to really take ownership, lay their hands upon the boy king who had just come to the throne. What happened was the king dies in a freak accident. Is out jousting one day, and a lance actually shatters, and it pierces his eye. Boom, he falls over dead. He was still in the steel of his youth. He had a number of years left, sort of illness or some other freak accident. But what this did is it left a bit of a power vacuum because the king was just a boy at this point. And as a result, Mary, Queen of Scots, and after her, Catherine de' Medici, really take a heavy hand in terms of running the kingdom we saw something like this, of course, in England with Edward VI. Boys were not allowed to be kings, despite the fairy tales of boy kings throughout all of medieval history. Well, this is, again, going to create a power vacuum, and really those who control the boy king and who can instill in him a sense of their perspective will have the upper hand whenever he reaches his majority. You actually see this kind of action a lot throughout history. Again, we saw with Edward, his tutors instilled in him Protestantism. And until the day he died, he was increasingly fervent about being a Protestant. The same, by the way, will happen, we'll see, when we get to James I of England, King James, the one who gave us the King James Bible. His mother and father were Catholic, 
His mother was Mary, Queen of Scots, and a controversy erupted when she killed her husband and ran off with her lover. And so they expelled her, and then they raised James, just a baby, to be a Protestant. And lo and behold, for the rest of his life, he was. Well, the Amboss conspiracy was by the Bourbons, by the more Calvinistic-leaning folks, to, you might say, take control of the king's person and to take control of all kinds of things related to his education and his upbringing. It's something like a kidnapping that is in play here, though it's not a kidnapping per se. Rather, it's an attempt to insinuate themselves within the life of this boy. Well, that move there in the 1560s is what sparks so much of the violence and the persecution and the civil wars thereafter. And it is for this reason that at times, again, the caricature of the Huguenots as militant and as hostile has a certain grain of truth to it, because they are. They are attempting to win the throne, or at least to win the influence over the throne. Well, there are attempts initially to try to calm things down between Catholics and Protestants there in France. There is something there in the 1560s right after the Amboise conspiracy known as the Colloquy of Poissy. And in this colloquy, you see a number of Protestants and Catholics come together, mostly theologians, men like Beza, the successor to Calvin, as well as a number of others, come together and they attempt to come to some grounding where they might stand as at least equals within the country. Now, it fails. There is no way to bring these two sides together. In fact, most ecumenical councils during the 16th century come to very little conclusion on anything. And those that do, the conclusions made are eventually rejected by both sides. But it's an honest attempt to calm the passions down. Well, in 1562, and from that point on, the Guy family begins to get a lot more aggressive. There was a duke from the Guy family, the second duke, actually, of the Guy household, named Francis. Now, I'm sorry here, <laughs> part of the problem in French history is just about everyone is named Francis or Henri or something like this. But in this case, again, it's Francis, the second duke of Guy. So there's that name, the Guy family, the hardline Catholics. And Francis is on tour throughout southern France, and he comes across the city of Vassay, and he notices that there are a number of Huguenots, a number of Protestants, worshiping while he is there. And what Francis decides is he's going to execute and murder them. Now, these are honest pastors and lay folks, and he murders and slaughters, some say high double digits, somewhere around 80. Other estimates go as high as 200 folks. But it's a staggeringly large number of unarmed lay folks that are killed, and roughly 100 are wounded there at the Massacre of Vassy. So here we are, standing terra firma in 1563, and we've had aggression from both sides. You might say from this point on, it only spirals downward. Back and forth, back and forth, you have a series of, frankly, eight unique, discrete civil wars that happen. Now, we usually lump all these decades into one large meta-bracket that we call the French Wars of Religion. And the French Wars of Religion are part of the wider Wars of Religion, which we've talked about before. But when you get down to it, there are really a lot of skirmishes. I often use the analogy, this is a bit like a mafia war. You have one clan whacking one of the other side, and then, well, you got to have vengeance. So they come back and whack somebody on their side. And it only gets worse and worse. Well, in 1563, again, immediately after a lot of these hostilities are getting pretty bad, you have an edict, the Edict of Amboise, 1563 which attempts to call a ceasefire, but it doesn't call for the laying down of arms. In fact, people have at times called this an armed peace, which, as history has shown us, armed peace is really not much of a peace at all, and it's only just sort of a prelude to another war, or another skirmish at least. On and on and on it goes, though, and I'm not going to give you all the dirty details, but it all comes to a head when you get to 1570, and you have a Protestant who was at the core or at the heart of power for France a man by the name of Admiral Gaspard de Coligny. Coligny is, as the title indicates, he's Admiral. He is a high-ranking member of the military forces for France. Well, Gaspard begins to form a relationship with Charles IX as he has grown older. He becomes really a father figure. And Coligny begins to ingratiate himself and become friendly with Charles. And this begins to make, again, the Catholics very uncomfortable. But Coligny's influence is pretty significant. And the next step is there is a proposed and approved a marriage between the Princess Margaret, the sister of Charles IX, 
with Henry of Navarre. Now, that name Navarre should again ring a bell because Marguerite of Navarre, the sister to Francis I back in the 1520s and 30s, who herself was evangelical, this is where Henry comes from. Well, Henry is a Protestant. So notice, Protestant nobleman marrying into the actual Valois family, marrying the princess. And given that Charles IX was still relatively young, there was no indication, no guarantee that he wouldn't either be tossed aside, maybe killed covertly, or should he die of natural causes, there was at least some indication, some plausibility at least, that you have a Protestant who is now in the Valois family, and he could maybe reach the throne. As a result, the Guy side, the hardline Catholics, make a pitch to the Queen Mother, Catherine de' Medici, asking her if they might both ruin this wedding and take out Coligny in the same stroke. Well, faithfully, Catherine de' Medici agrees. She takes away the blocks that are stopping the Guy from doing everything they want, and she allows for an execution, you might say, street style, of Coligny and some others there during the wedding between Henry of Navarre and the Princess Margaret. What this floodgate opening does is it leads to one of the greatest massacres in at least the 16th century, and really for centuries thereafter, the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, late summer in 1570. Now, this begins as an attempt to take out Coligny and some of his entourage. As they are walking through the streets of Paris during the wedding, and a wedding during this time would be a week, could be a lot of festivities and parties and things, a lot of people with their guard down, you might say. Well, as Coligny is walking through the streets of Paris, Someone at a second-story window produces a pistol and fires upon Coligny. And he is wounded, wounded quite badly, in fact. His men scoop him up, they flee, they get to his apartments where he was staying, and they take him up there, onto the second floor. Well, a mob, a Catholic mob, breaks in, goes up to the second floor, they finish the deed of taking out Coligny, as well as Coligny's men. They then castrate him, because obviously that's what you do to embarrass somebody, I suppose. And they then throw his dead body out of the window down onto the street. What ensues over the next weeks and months from this single act of aggression is something like a widespread panic all throughout Paris and even through other parts of France. People just go slap mad. They start murdering anyone who is said to be Huguenot. Estimates at this point are that somewhere in the neighborhood of 25,000 people are murdered in Paris alone. Throughout the countryside, somewhere in the neighborhood of ten to 15,000 are also murdered. Now, if you just do the math, we have a couple million people, and they've only lost 20, 30,000. But this is bloodshed at its worst. These are serious massacres. You end up having essentially mass graves to deal with all the bodies that they've created through these massacres. A lot of what this does is it breaks, you might say, the spirit of the Huguenots. While they had attempted... And they will still continue to attempt at the political level to take France for themselves. At the lay level, they are all too vulnerable. There is no stopping a mob from descending upon a Huguenot church, even if it's meeting in relative peace, and burning it down with people inside it, this kind of a thing. And it's the ongoing tussles of the 1560s, and in particular the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, that forces Huguenots to flee, frankly, all throughout the known world. To this day, in fact, you can find Huguenot churches and establishments and little pockets all throughout much of the known world. For example, there's a Huguenot establishment in Rio de Janeiro down in Brazil. And if you know anything about the Brazilian church, the Protestant church there, you know it has a pretty significant influence from the Reformed or Calvinistic perspective. A lot of it can be traced back, at least in part, to this genealogy of the Huguenots fleeing and landing there in Brazil. In my own life, in my own context, I live in Jacksonville, Florida. Well, Jacksonville was a Huguenot establishment in some ways, in some small ways. Huguenots landed here and they established Fort Caroline along the banks of the St. John's River. And Fort Caroline, again, was a Huguenot establishment. You can go through all areas of England, the Netherlands, South America, places like Brazil, South Africa, and all up and down the east coast of modern North America, and find places where Huguenots landed to escape the real serious persecution of their peoples. So at the lay level, you might say, there was a scattering, there was a fleeing of the Huguenots. 
of these French Calvinists in order to find a better place for themselves. And I do think this is worth noting because a lot of people in the modern American world think that only the Puritans, only the English were somewhat persecuted when they fled on boats like the Mayflower for the New World. Well, the Huguenots came first. Fort Caroline, for example, was established in the 1560s, a good number of decades before even the first Puritans or pilgrims, you might say, began to leave England for the New World. And as I'll say when we get to those lectures, the Puritans and the pilgrims were hardly being persecuted anywhere close to the amount to the reality that the Huguenots were experiencing in France. Well, how did this end? What about the political level? Well, it ends with a really duplicitous kind of fellow, a guy who's going down on history as a real kind of cynic, Henry IV. Henry IV was, again, the same Henry who had married the Princess Margaret. He does, at some point, lay claim to the throne and believe that it's his. And the civil wars carry on, and Henry marches step by step on his way to take Paris, which, in part, in a very significant way, would mean that he would capture the throne. Well, at some point in the 1590s, Henry converts to Catholicism. And historians have long tried to figure out why he would do this. He kind of rides on the wave of Protestantism, and then at the end, he converts. There is one unfortunate phrase that he uttered, which is that, quote, Paris is worth at least a mass. And what probably the majority opinion is, though, again, there are challenges to this theory, is that Henry comes to the conclusion that at some point he is not going to rule France as a Protestant. And what he wants more than anything is to rule and to be king. And for him, the religious factor, whether he's Catholic or Protestant, was maybe not irrelevant, but to him, it was worth becoming Catholic in order to take Paris and to take the throne. And that is what he does. Now, one last piece. Not all of the French Protestants fled. It's not as if everyone left. There were, for centuries, French Protestants still there in Paris, and they were subject at time to persecution, sometimes violent, sometimes suppression, oppression, you might say. And so the long story of the French Calvinists, or the French Reformed folks, the Huguenots, is frankly one of the most underappreciated stories at a popular level. We have heroes like Luther and Calvin and Cranmer and others, but frankly, when you look at good shepherding pastors who are leading a flock in the midst of real serious doubt and a trial on their life. Many died for their faith here. It is hard to find people who deserve our respect more than the Huguenots. Mm-hmm.